So that's, that's great. Um, I thought I would give you, as Vera did, a general overview and then introduce our two magnificent speakers who will say far more interesting things than I'm going to say. I, I'm the sort of amuse-bouche at the start of the meal. They're, they're going to satisfy your craving for, uh, for understanding about subjective well-being. I, I wanted to say first that there may be some doubters in the audience who worry about why we even need to care about concepts like happiness, life satisfaction, subjective well-being. I just want to remind you that, that, that I think most economists, maybe all economists, and everybody would accept that national income, GDP, is not really enough. We're not saying it's, it's wrong, it's bad, we shouldn't look at it. We're saying that it doesn't capture quite enough for us to fully understand human well-being. And I think you can go back to the birth of national income accounting, sort of 1930s, if you like, and even then, big names like Simon Kuznets, one of the big economic historians of the first half of the 20th century, pointed out that GDP includes military spending. So if GDP really is a measure of well-being, as you're preparing for a war, GDP rises, and apparently the population are getting really happy about it. If that, that cannot be right, right. It cannot be that increased spending in preparation for war is a good measure of the well-being of society. Similarly, if you look at the BP Deep Horizons oil spill, one of the biggest environmental catastrophes in recent years, US GDP went up. Of course it did. You're fixing a major problem. A huge rescue, a huge cleanup um, operation was in practice. So GDP rose. But we can't seriously argue that well-being was increased by the BP Deep Horizons oil spill. That makes no sense. Right? So I think that a key thing about well-being, which is the absolute core of theme three, understanding and measuring well-being, is not that it's an alternative to GDP. We're not saying that years and years of good economics has been wasted. We're saying that we're just doing a little bit extra to help us fill in those gaps and to understand well-being in a broader sense, to understand why perhaps an environmental catastrophe isn't good for well-being and why wars maybe aren't good for well-being. Because if we just use GDP, we're going to get a slightly incorrect uh, impression of the way the world really is. So, so theme three has, has three strands, but they all relate to this idea, this broad notion of well-being that, as economists, we're all extremely interested in. Um, one part of that is understanding and measuring national well-being. You can think of that as the sort of macroeconomics bit. The other part is the microeconomics bit, which is sort of flipping things um, in the other direction. So when people talk about happiness economics or national well-being, we're normally thinking about what generates increases in national happiness. So what economic events or behavior change national happiness. That's the first part of the theme. The second part flips that on its head and says, well, how, does, how do changes in well-being and happiness at the individual level affect economic behavior? So instead of economic behavior to happiness, we're thinking happiness to economic behavior. And the final part of that is really closing the whole thing and thinking about the interactions between well-being and poverty, which after all is the big thing that we're trying to deal with as economists. And those, those are the three parts, the three sub-themes of theme three. And I want to stress already that, as Vera mentioned, a big part, of, and as Nick mentioned, a big part of Cage's interdisciplinary work, and for us that means working with psychologists and with behavioral scientists more generally. If we want to understand well-being and happiness, we cannot claim to have a monopoly on this as economists. That's not something we can do. So a lot of our work is very interdisciplinary and spans many different disciplines. I, I'll have two seconds to talk about some of my own work, which is, involves talking to linguists, for example, which might not immediately jump out of you as an obvious set of collaborators for economists. So that first strand of what we do, understanding and measuring well-being, that I mentioned is really the macro part, has many highlights. And really, the theme is lucky enough to have Andrew Oswald as a key part of, of what we do, who has been working tirelessly on this for many years, and indeed in collaboration with Gus. And, and it's particularly fantastic to have them both here following me and giving you the, the, the meat that you're all going to be yearning for um, in this part of the talk. So I think that I have nowhere near enough time to summarize what Andrew has done in the last 10 years, even, even, in, 10, even in 10 years, probably, let alone 10 minutes. But I'm going to mention a couple of important things. And Andrew has talked about how national happiness is driven, what the key drivers are over the years, how it interacts with key important issues in well-being, things like mental health, suicide rates, for example. And it has some remarkable findings, for, for instance, showing how even seemingly quite, I, I guess they are important, but for economists at least, seemingly quite minor things like diet can radically change how happy people are. And if economists care about happiness, then economists should care about diet. 
And so the wonderful thing about happiness work is it gives us links to all very various different things and tells us that these are actually part of economics. So as economists, it's not unreasonable to be investigating whether people should be eating fruit and veg, for example. And this is the sort of stuff that Andrew does. Um, and Andrew and Gus together have worked on how different measures of well-being can and should inform policy. I think that's something that, that Gus is going to talk about now. What, what would government policy be if, if, if well-being really was at the heart of, of what governments cared about? I said I'd give you a few seconds on the sort of weird stuff that I occasionally do, but for me at least, um, I'm worried about the paucity of data, the paucity of national well-being data. So in this part of the theme, the thing that worries me the most is that we only have really survey data, time series survey data from the 1970s onwards. And that's a worry, especially when compared to GDP, where we have data going back to the 1930s that, that came out of the whole national income accounting sort of revolution. But economic historians, People like Stephen Broadbury have rolled it back way further than that. So we have data back to the 13th century for national income for the UK. So how can having survey data from the 1970s onwards compare to that? So I've tried to use modern techniques in psychological linguistics to infer mood from text, to look at newspapers, books, etc., going back hundreds of years and create an alternative index of national well-being based on what people wrote and read in, in past centuries, for example. And, and so we can now use that potentially, to try and understand how well-being has evolved over time. So the second part of um, what I wanted to talk about is this sort of microeconomics element. I've already sort of introduced that. But to give you one example, working with Andrew and others, um, we tried to understand how changes in happiness at the micro level, at the individual level, can influence behavior. The big thing we wanted to look at first was productivity. And we discovered that happier individuals are more productive. They work harder. And the effects are quite dramatic and very statistically significant, and we replicated them in many different ways in simple lab experiments where individuals were made happier, we saw that they worked harder, but also individuals who sustained serious negative life shocks even five years earlier still faced gaps, holes in their productivity, and were still significantly lower, produ lower productivity than people who had not faced these sorts of negative shocks. You put all this together and you, you can see how happiness can generate productivity, which can generate growth, which can in turn perhaps feed back. You can see potential for vicious and virtuous cycles of all sorts. The final part of the theme, uh, work particularly led by Anandi Mani, is all about well-being, poverty, and cognition. So this is a sort of cognitive ability. And in particular, probably the centerpiece of that work has been demonstrating that if you take people that are in um, extreme poverty, that has a dramatic effect on their cognitive skill. So if you, if you marry that into the rest of, of, of the theme, essentially um, what we're saying is that individuals that have been pushed into a position of extreme poverty, their ability to think, their ability to work through problems collapses, which is not going to help them get out of poverty. And then they'll be trapped in a sort of low well-being cycle. OK, so I, in an effort to try and stick to time, I'll, I'll say a couple of things about the future, and then I'm going to introduce Andrew. So I think happiness economics, despite the fact that Andrew has been doing this for a long time, is still in its infancy. Um, I think that Andrew has achieved a lot himself. The rest of the profession is only now catching up, and there's still a lot for us to do. I think it's very important for us to interact more with industry, with the private and public sector. We can't be thinking about well-being without thinking about the people that are going to benefit from well-being. You can't examine happiness in isolation. It's a meaningless thing to do. So it's not surprising that a lot of the work that we've done has had a fair amount of impact, media attention, etc. cetera. Um, I want to stop now and um, introduce Andrew, who I think is going to talk about midlife crises.